Thank you, Mark, and good morning. Does the time change next week? Does? Remember that. <laughs> I'll try to do the same. And uh, I'll try to remember what we're doing today. It's uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're starting a new chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. So Colossians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. The 19th century evangelist Dwight L. Moody used to warn people about being so heavenly minded that they were no earthly good. There's some value in that, I suppose, but I must say I've never met a Christian who was too heavenly minded. I don't think that's our problem today. I don't think Paul thought it was a problem in his day. In fact, his instruction to us is to be heavenly minded. That is the only way to be any earthly good. He tells the Colossians, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Where Christ is, is heaven. He is alive from the dead, ascended to the Father's right hand, and we are to be thinking of Him, where He is and all of the things pertaining to Him. That's how we're to live. That's Paul's instruction in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This part of the book is about application, so we now enter into the second phase of the book, a new part of the book. Paul developed doctrine in the previous two chapters. Now he shows its implications for our life. At the end of chapter 2, he told the Colossians that every believer in Jesus Christ died with Christ. His death was our death. He died as our substitute. He took our place in judgment. He died as our representative. And he paid for all of our sins at the cross. We just sang about that in Top Lady's Hymn. As a result, when we appropriate all of that, all of those blessings through faith, we are no longer the people we once were. The old person is dead. We're new creatures. We have new life. But how are we to live that new life? That was one of the issues the Colossians were struggling with, and it's one that Christians deal with in every generation. How do we overcome sin and live well? There were false teachers instructing them to, to how to do that, um, suggesting how to do that by submitting to a system of rules Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Trying to put them under the law, trying to put them under a legalistic system. They were teaching the Colossians a method for rising above earthly temptations. It was by means of following a code of conduct that was made up of ceremonies and rules. Now that is typical of human religion. It's the idea that We need to protect ourselves from the world and its temptations by building a fence of man-made rules around our lives. And so men develop a list of taboos. They develop a list of things to be avoided, things not to taste, things not to touch, so that the spiritual life becomes a method of rule-keeping. It's reduced to a mechanical kind of system of following the rules. That's not the Christian life. There are principles of conduct, of course, but it is fundamentally a relationship. 
The Christian has been joined to the living Christ. As Paul says in verse 3, we have been hidden with Christ in God. We're in Christ, Christ is in us, and we are in God. We are joined to Him so that His life is lived in us. We have His power in us, which enables us to obey and overcome temptation. And we have access to that life through faith. That's how we live, by faith. But there are things that we must do to strengthen our faith and motivate to obedience. We must think on the right things. That is what Paul instructs us to do. But first he lays the, the ground for that instruction by reminding us of who we are. That's the significance of the word, therefore, that begins the chapter. It looks to something before. It connects us to the previous passage where the believer is described as having died with Christ. So therefore, it's drawing an implication or a conclusion from what he has just said. So therefore, he says, in light of what he has previously said and what he's previously said, is that your your old life is gone. You have died. If you have been raised up with Christ, or better, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. A believer is dead to the old life and has been raised up to the new life, and therefore live it, is what he's saying. Seek those things above. And we can do that, and we should do that, because we are new creatures. We are members of God's family. We don't have to struggle in order to obtain that position. We don't have to struggle each day to become a child of God or a son or a daughter of God. That is ours through faith. At the moment of faith, we are that. We have that through Christ who obtained all of that for us. We received it the moment we believed in Him. So now, because of who we are as children of God, our interests are to be different. We're different people. Our pursuits, our affections, our desires are to be different. They're to be consistent with our new standing and position and our new life. We are to seek that life. Our, our thoughts are to be oriented around the things above. And our wills, our efforts are to be applied to obtaining them, obtaining the things above. We're to pursue them. And that's to be a constant effort. That's the idea here. Keep seeking continually is the sense of the command. To that, Paul adds in verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. The first command to seek addresses our will, our resolve. The second command addresses our minds. The things that fill our minds affect the way we live our lives. We have an expression, you are what you eat. If a person eats unhealthy food, it's most likely that he or she is going to be an unhealthy person. And it's the same in matters of the mind. If we focus on worldly things, we will be worldly. But if we put our minds and our thoughts on heavenly things, our lives will be influenced by the heavenly. The way to overcome the lure of the world and temptations of the flesh is not by concentrating on all the things that we shouldn't do. And really what that often does is, is stir up the desire for those very things because we're focusing our mind on those things. The best way to overcome evil is with good. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. We overcome evil with good. And, and we do that by filling our minds with good things, with good thoughts, the things that are above, as Paul says. Well, what are these things above that are so important for us to fix our minds on, fill our thoughts with. Paul doesn't say. But the context gives a good indication. 
They are where Christ is at the right hand of God. So we can break that down and understand the things above and the things we're to think of by looking at that instruction. First of all, let's think of God. We're to make Him the object of our thoughts and affections. We are to consider the greatness of our God. There is nothing more sanctifying, there is nothing more life-changing and purifying than doing that. A few weeks ago, I quoted Charles Spurgeon on thinking about God. And I'm going to quote him again. It's an excellent quote. He said, There is something exceeding improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. No subject will tend to more humble the mind than thoughts of God. But while the whole subject humbles the mind, it also expands it. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the, the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. Now Spurgeon introduced his sermon that Sunday morning in 1855 with those words. It was his first sermon of his great minister, London ministry. And he preached that at the age of 20. Well, that's a profound thought, a profound way of looking at things from a person at such a young age. But that can explain the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, why from such an early age he had such an influence, not just on London and England, but he had a worldwide influence. He had a, a life of wisdom and stability because from a young age he did this very thing that Paul is speaking of here. He set his mind on the things above, on the things of God. He meditated deeply, thought deeply about the Godhead, and it does expand the mind and sanctify. Listen, it, it's... It is appropriate, it's necessary at times to give a sermon on things like finances or spend time during a lesson exposing error that maybe is taught by a prominent preacher or, or uh, that, that is circulating in a popular heresy. Those things need to be discussed, those things need to be exposed, but that's not a steady spiritual diet. We want to grow. And nothing will improve our mind more and make us better people than thinking upon God and His greatness. He's infinite and eternal. There is no end to that subject. We'll spend all eternity on that subject and never come to the end of it. World without end, subject without end. And that's what we're to think about. What a great subject. He is holy and just and loving. His love is sovereign and electing. He chose every believer for, for salvation from all eternity. That's a great thought. Now, that's a thought I know that troubles some. Uh, why it would confound a Christian I find puzzling. It's taught throughout the Bible. Moses taught it in Deuteronomy 7, the electing grace of God. Jesus taught it, John chapter 6. Paul taught it in Ephesians chapter 1. You were chosen from the foundation of the world. Here in chapter 3, in verse 12, he'll teach it again. Peter taught election in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. And that's just a few of the, the passages where the doctrine of unconditional election is taught. It's, it's God's work. And what can be more mentally healthy and encouraging than to know that the holy God chose us? Not because we're holy, not because we're deserving, not because we're lovely, we're not. 
He chose dead sinners for himself and for his blessing. Chose us to be his children. Made us alive and whole and he will never let us go. After all, if he loved us when we were his enemies, if he loved us when we were completely unlovely, he will love us now that we are his children and love us regardless. He'll never stop loving us and never forsake us and never stop changing us, transforming us. That is, in part, what Paul wants us to think about. God the Father, His greatness and wisdom, His sovereignty and His love. But at God's right hand is Christ His Son. So we should set our minds on Him. He's described as seated. And that tells us a lot about what we're to think about. In fact, He is seated the fact that he is, in, he is seated in, he, in heaven tells us about his deity. His provenance, his origin is heaven. He's the eternal son of God. He is from heaven. He's seated there. That speaks of his deity. The fact that he's seated at God's right hand tells us about his power. The almighty power that he wields. And the fact that he is seated tells us about his work. It's finished. Now, this is the stuff of, of endless sermons. You can spend 50 years preaching on all of this, looking at it from all different angles and preaching it. You preach through the Word of God, you're going to preach those things. That's what we're to think about. But when we think of Him, we should remember that He is not only God, He's also man. That he's very God of very God. He is our creator. That's John chapter 1 verse 3. All things came into being through him. But he's also our savior. He became a man. That's John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh. And we beheld his glory. And becoming a man, he died in our place. All our sins were laid upon him. And they were punished in Him. And in Him they were removed when He was crucified. Removed as far as the east is from the west. And that work is finished. There's nothing that we can do, nothing that we can add to what He's done that will complete it because it is complete. That's the significance of him being seated, having finished the work of atonement, having finished the work of salvation on the cross, having satisfied God's justice, he sat down. You know this, the priests in the Old Testament, the priests of Aaron, never sat down, not during their priestly work. There was no chair for them in the tabernacle or the temple. There's lots of furniture in those Places There was the altar and the, candles, the candelabra and various articles of furniture, but there was no chair. And there was no chair because priests in the Old Testament never sat down because their work was never finished. It was never done. The, the final sacrifice was never given. They always had to do another one. Morning and evening, morning and evening. And then the great days of the Day of Atonement and the Passover... But this priest completed everything necessary for our salvation. He declared from the cross, it is finished. And that was a great, the greatest statement of triumph ever given. It is finished. He declared the victory in those words. And when he ascended into heaven, he sat down. Now... That great thought will occupy our minds forever as well. That while we were yet sinners, as Paul wrote in Romans 5, Christ died for us. We, we can understand him dying for a good person. In fact, this is what Paul says. We can understand that maybe someone will die in the place of another if that person is a loved one, is a good person, deserving we can understand dying for deserving people, but we're not deserving. We were hostile toward God. We were His enemies when He died for us. 
That's how Paul describes us in Romans 8 verse 7, at enmity with him. So I like the, the way P.T. Forsyth put it. I quote this periodically. It's a great statement. He says, we are rebels taken with weapons in our hands. In the midst of our rebellion is when he died for us and saved us. Why did he do that? Why did he love us? Well, as I said, <clears throat> that's a mystery that we will meditate on for all eternity. It will never cease to amaze us. It, the, the amazement will only increase. But it ought to amaze us now, and it ought to be the object of our thoughts now. He is still ministering to us. He, his work is finished regarding the atonement, regarding propitiation, satisfying God in regard to our sin and judgment, we can't add anything to his sacrifice. We simply receive it by faith. But his priestly work of praying for us hasn't ended. He's still ministering to us from the throne of heaven where he is seated. He is guiding us and he's protecting us. He is seated there in power. So all of the, the power of the Godhead is working in our favor working in your favor as his child, individually working for you. You have an illustration of this from the Aaronic priesthood. The pre Aaron and the priests that followed him had certain clothing they wore, certain articles that they wore. One was a breastplate with the names of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes on it. And then on his shoulder he wore these these uh, stones that had engraved on them the tribes of Israel, six on one, six on the other. He would bring them before God. That was part of his priestly service. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing for us now. Bringing us before him, not just in some great sort of collection. Individually, he's dealing with this. He's praying for you at every moment. Right now, today, tomorrow, forever interceding for you personally according to your needs, your particular issues. And His power is working for us. It, it is almighty power, but it is power tempered by love and guided by wisdom. If it was simply power, the power of God, the omnipotence of God, that would be a frightening thing. Power can annihilate. But this is that kind of power that could vaporize the universe in a moment governed by his love and directed by his infinite wisdom so that it always does what is right. Fix your mind on that. Know it to be true. He may lead us through some difficult experiences. He may lead us through the the valley of the shadow of death, and uh, he will do that. You can count on that. We're all going to go through dark valleys. But he's always beside us, and he's always before us, leading us and protecting us. John Bunyan gives a good example of that. I, you've noticed, I'm sure, I like to refer to Pilgrim's Progress because Bunyan had amazing insight into the Christian life, and he covers all of it in that book, both the first one and the second one. But early in the, uh, the first book, when Christian comes to the wicket gate and sees the cross and the burden falls off his shoulders, he begins his journey to the celestial city. <clears throat> it's not long before he begins to have difficulties along the way, which is true to the Christian life. And he finds himself crossing a valley and he's walking across this valley on a very, very narrow path. On one side is a deep ditch. On the other side is a bottomless pit of quicksand. And it's dark. It's so dark he can't see in front of him to know where to put the next foot in front of the other as he walks across this very narrow path. Smoke and fire coming up from the pit of hell, and he heard voices softly suggesting wicked, faithless thoughts. But after walking in this condition for a while, he finally heard a voice saying, 
Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And he was glad. He realized that God was with him. So he went on. And Bunyan writes, By and by the day broke and turned the shadow of death into morning. That's how we live the Christian life, really. It's a narrow path with dangers around and it's difficult to know what to do next. But if we follow Him, if we're led by the Spirit, if we're in fellowship with Him and walking in obedience, He guides us providentially and guides us wisely. The Lord is always with us. We have a living Savior. He is actively working for us now, right this moment, and always. As the psalmist said, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. It may be dark, but he's awake and he's watching and guiding. Now, these are some of the things that Spurgeon said, comfort the soul, calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, and speak peace to the winds of trial. That comes with thinking on the subject of the Godhead. And then the things above include heaven itself, the beauty of it, the purity of it, the, the comfort of it, the happiness of it. It's a place of rest. We all think about that. That's our, that's our destination. That's where we're going. This brief life is over briefly, and that's where we're going to be. Should we not think about our heavenly home? And how great it is and glorious it is. We're, we're often impressed with great estates, large houses that we see in this world. Perhaps you've traveled and you've been to some place like Europe and you've seen the great palaces and castles there. Maybe you've been uh, to Versailles outside of Paris and you've gone through that magnificent palace of uh, Louis XIV and through the Hall of Mirrors and then gone out into the the vast estate with its gardens and what, what a place to live in. And it would be. And there are places around here that would be magnificent to live in, but there are nothing, and there's nothing in this world that can begin to compare with what Christ has prepared for us in heaven and the world to come. In his Father's house. What must it be like to live in the house of God the Father? And heaven is not our ultimate destination, the kingdom to come on this earth, and then the new heavens and the new earth, world without end. That's our destiny. That's where we're going. It's a glorious destiny, glorious beyond words. Trials all ended, and unending joy before us, joy that will only increase exponentially forever and ever. What a thought that is. It's not going to be a, a moment, and I can't explain eternity. Is there time? Is there not time? Those are debates that men have. But there will never be a moment where there's a lull. You're going to have joy from the moment you're there that, like you've never had, and it will. every moment of your existence will only increase exponentially forever and ever. And your knowledge will only increase forever and ever. What a thought, as I said. We, we should set our thoughts on that and remember that the things we do in this world for Christ, count for that. Count for the future. Count forever. There is great reward coming for the faithful. And we're not simply motivated by the reward though I think that's motivation. We're motivated to live obediently because of the love that he's given to us and shown us. And as we live obediently in the smallest things to the greatest things, God rewards that faithful life. And then the things above include the occupants of heaven, the, the saints who are there and who we will see and know. And when I use that word saint, I'm using it according to the scriptures that Every believer in Jesus Christ is a saint, a, a sanctified one, a set-apart one. And when we enter into heaven, we're going to be with the saints that are there, and we're going to see them all and know them all, the innumerable multitude of them. People sometimes ask me, 
uh, are we going to recognize each other when we get to heaven? And I have to tell you, I'm a little surprised by that. Paul ends 1 Corinthians 13 saying, now we see in a glass darkly, then face to face. In other words, what he's saying, what he's saying is, even I, the apostle, see things only vaguely right now, but then I'm going to see everything clearly. Yes, you'll know everybody there instantly, and they'll all be your best friend. That's heaven. You're going to know Paul and Moses and go down the list. A great company of fellowship. The best of all, in the center of it all, will be the Lamb standing as if slain, the resurrected Christ and Savior, and He will occupy our attention and our affection, and we will have close fellowship with Him. And John speaks of that at the end of John, uh, Revelation 7 about the shepherd leading the sheep from spring to spring. And the idea, particularly in an agrarian place like uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, would, this is places of refreshment and we're with him, and he's refreshing us, and we're having deep fellowship with him, that he will, be, he will be the focus of our attention. But of course, that being the case, he should be the center of our thoughts now. We should focus on him, all of these things. Now, having said that, that does not mean, of course, that our minds are in no way to be occupied with the things of this world, to be engaged in the daily routines of life, uh, that would be reducing Paul's instruction here to the absurd. He's not telling us to withdraw from the world of business or medicine or law or art or any profession. He calls his people into those fields and we are to strive in each of those fields, whatever field we've been called to, to excel in them. Well, one, of, one of the ways that God has blessed Believer's Chapel, and I've seen this over the many years that I've been here, as he's blessed us, he's blessed this assembly with godly doctors and lawyers and businessmen, all kinds of people. And they, in that, those capacities, have been a blessing to this place. And, and that's nothing to discount. We are to strive for excellence in whatever field we are in. But our profession, our job, is not to hold first place in our hearts. It's to be seen as a ministry, and, and all that we do is to be done for the Lord and His people. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything from the, the simplest to the most complex, to the, from the mundane to the sublime, all of it is to be done to His glory. So be a doctor, a housewife, a bricklayer, whatever you are, to the glory of God. But you'll only do that as you set your mind on Christ and the things above. That takes effort. That takes discipline. It means regularly putting our thoughts on God's Word. That's how we find out and learn about the things above. Our situation of uh, earning a living in the world has been compared to that of the birds of the air that need to fly down to earth to feed. And that's always a danger because there are traps down here, there are guns and hunters waiting for them down here. So a bird is never safe when it feeds in a field or on a pond. To avoid danger, it has to eat and take flight quickly. And as we mix with the world, as we should, as we must, we have to be cautious not to get in a trap, which means not allow ourselves to become enamored of the world. The way to do that is desire other things more. Desire God and the things of God more than the things of this world. But we will only do that by setting our minds on the things above. Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Try it, believe it, meditate on it. Try Him, believe Him, meditate on Him. It's a mental exercise. 
Setting our minds on the things above is an act of the will, but it has great rewards. What we tend to do, though, is get caught up in our job or in some worldly concerns. We're very much like Martha and not Mary, Lazarus' two sisters. Martha, you remember, was busying herself with preparing a meal for the Lord and His disciples. She did a good work. She did an unnecessary work. She was doing what she was supposed to be doing, but she became encumbered by it. She became overwhelmed with it. That wasn't the Lord's desire for her. It wasn't what the Lord was requiring of her. The Lord preferred that she do her work adequately, but then, like her sister Mary, sit at His feet and learn from Him. Uh, even, in our, even in the ministry, it's easy to get caught up in the details of it and a lot of the activity of it and lose sight of the, of the subject of it, of the Lord Himself, and begin doing work for Him without really learning from Him and fellowshipping with Him. That's what we are to do. Be in fellowship with Him. And that will prepare us to walk and work in the world in a way that is worthy of our calling, worthy of the new life that he has obtained for us. Paul reinforces his instruction in verse 3 where he says, For you have died. Now that is repeating and emphasizing the statement that he made in verse 1 and that he made in chapter 2. We died with Christ but he repeats it here because it needs to be repeated. It needs to be emphasized. The old life is over. You are not the person that you once were. Again, we need to know that. The old self was crucified with Christ, and at the moment of faith when you appropriated that death for yourself, which was done for you, then you became a new creature. The old person died. And therefore, we are to set our minds on the new things, not the old life, not the things that are on earth. They have a new self, a new life, and that life, Paul said, is hidden with Christ in God. It is safe. We cannot be separated from God in Christ. That is a a statement of great security. We, We are, as it were, in a double fortress, hidden with Christ in God. That is both our security and our source of life. And so we are to nourish that life. We are to develop our relationship with the Lord. That's that's eternal life. That's John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, to know the only true God and His Son. We sang that in the hymn we sang earlier. So we are to think on Him and we are to desire Him just as Mary did by sitting at the Savior's feet. And like the psalmist did in Psalm 42, it's just a great expression of what Paul is urging us to do. David wrote, "As as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you. The The more we taste the Lord, the more we will thirst for Him. And the more we will desire the Lord and the more we will live for the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said there is nothing more practical than that. It both humbles the mind and expands the mind. Paul would have agreed with that completely. That's the purpose of his inspired counsel here. To expand our minds. But that being so, the opposite would also be true. Not thinking on the things above, thinking instead on earthly things shrinks the mind and inflates the ego. Found an illustration of that from one of Charles Spurgeon's contemporaries, one of the most celebrated men of the age, Charles Darwin. His last book, just before he died, was on worms. I found that interesting because Darwin began his education studying for the ministry, training to be an Anglican priest, setting his thoughts on the things above, 
until he became more interested in botany, in plants, in things on earth. Over time, his belief in God faded and his confidence in the natural sciences increased. Disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, he confided, but was at last complete. The man who began studying God ended studying worms. That's a poor exchange. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to study science. It's not. It's a good thing to study science. And in fact, through the study of science, we see God's wisdom in this creation. We see his wisdom even in things crawling in the dirt. But I find a parable in Darwin's life. It's what happens when a person exchanges the things above for the things below, the things of earth. Disbelief will creep over him, maybe slowly but surely, until he worships the creation rather than the creator and gradually exchanges God for worms. Spurgeon was right. There is something exceeding improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. Nothing will humble the mind and expand it more than studying the things above. That is where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. There is no greater blessing, no more enlightening blessing, mind-expanding blessing than studying and knowing Jesus Christ. That's the blessing of the present, but we have a future blessing. Paul speaks of it in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. That's our future. It's not our present. Right now, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. The world can't see the glory of what we have. We can't even see that glory very well. It's yet to be revealed, revealed in us. But that day will certainly come when it will be revealed. Paul spoke of that back in chapter 1, verse 27, when he spoke of the hope of glory that we have. We have a wonderful, unimaginably glorious future. Weeping may last for the night, the psalmist said, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Now that statement in the psalm, Psalm 30, verse 5, is a present blessing. That's true for us right now. But it looks ultimately to what Paul is speaking of here. Ultimately to the return of our Lord. And then there will be a shout of glory and it will be a new morning, a new dawn. Knowing that, thinking about that is sanctifying. It gives perspective on life now in this world, this, this veil of tears that is even now passing away. And it gives incentive to us to live for what is to come and what is permanent. These things out here that enamor us, that, that attract us so much, that, that get a hold on our affections, are not permanent. We can't keep them for very long. What's permanent is what is to come. That's what we're to be living for. But we won't do that, we won't understand that if we don't set our minds on the things above. Those who set their minds on the things below lose perspective. Think only of this world and live for it. Really, it is those who are heavenly minded that are earthly good because we know the world is passing away and what is done for Christ in this life and for others, that lasts, and only that lasts. But you'll never have that perspective, that broad view of reality, unless you have the mind of God and develop it by cultivating thoughts of God which direct and motivate obedience to God. That's the best life. That's the full life. A life that requires discipline and focus, a willingness to cut out things, good things, in order to have the best things. But it is a life of great rewards, both now and for eternity. 
We have that life only in Jesus Christ. And we are joined to Him only through faith. Faith in the One who is the Savior. The Savior from sin's power and the Savior from sin's penalty. The judgment to come. He has opened up heaven for sinners. For those who are in resistance against Him. He's opened up heaven for those who turn and believe. So if you're here without Christ, we urge you, recognize yourself as being in rebellion, in sin, and flee to the cross where you will receive forgiveness and everlasting life. Pray to Him for faith and believe in Christ. May God help you to do that and then help you, help all of us to live for Him. Set our minds on the important eternal thing. Well, the great hymn, I think, for us to sing in light of all this is one that we sang last week, but it's a wonderful hymn, hymn number 23 in the Songs of Praise books. Let's stand and sing before the throne of God alone and then remain standing for the benediction. Number 23. What a great thought that is, Father, that our lives are hid with Christ in God. We are in Him. He's within us. We are in the Godhead, safe and being blessed with life at every moment. Thank you. Help us to think deeply on these things that we might live a life that's pleasing to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, Warren.